I'm seeing things happening with church leaders and entertainers and people from all over. And what we are seeing is the evidence of what happens when people get power, they get influence, but their hearts are not committed to God. Hey there, family. We are back and we are still in the book of Esther, y'all. If you are just now joining us, it's okay. Go ahead and watch this video because there is more to come, but also make sure you go back to the other videos and watch those because there's been so much revelation that God has been giving us as we have been diving into the book of Esther. We are on Esther chapter seven. That means we only have about three more chapters to go and the plot is thickening y'all. It is getting real. But as always, I want you to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications so that whenever a new video comes out, you are aware that it's available to you. And we have the Esther study guide to go along with this. You don't have to get it in order to watch the videos, but I am confident it will enhance your time with God like never before. So grab that Esther study guide today. Now let's get started with reading Esther chapter seven. You should have read it already, but if not, I'm gonna pause for a moment for you to read it. Then you're gonna come back, I'm gonna teach, you're gonna reread it, and then we'll talk about it in the comments. So it's your turn. Pause and read Esther seven if you haven't done so. I told y'all the plot has thickened seriously. So let's begin by reading verses one through three together. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. On the second occasion, while they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it's half of the kingdom. Queen Esther replied, if I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. So there are a few things that I specifically want to note from these first three verses that's going to help set us up for what we're getting ready to read. But also I want to pause and recognize some things that's happening already. The first is that the king's heart had already been softened for this moment. Between Esther's first banquet and God's divine intervention of a sleepless night leading to him reading the book of history where it was revealed that Mordecai had saved him from being assassinated. So now his heart was softened to the Jews because he knew that Mordecai was a Jew and Mordecai had saved his life. The second thing is that Esther had already faced death once on behalf of the people. Seeing God show up in that way likely gave her some confidence and courage as she approached this moment with the king and Haman. Now, this was a very difficult moment for Esther because Haman was second in command. She was going before the king to ask that her life and the life of her people be preserved. Her even approaching the king was putting her in the line of potential death. And she had already overcome that moment. So now we are at another moment where she has to present some very difficult news to the king. And she's going into this moment, likely with a little bit more courage, but hesitation as well. It doesn't say that, but I'm just imagining that she was still hesitant because this was some major news she was getting ready to present to the king. And then the final thing is that the king was in a state of vulnerability and desire to please the queen. I believe he needed to be in this place because he was about to receive some devastating news and knowing who to trust was important, but also remembering his love for the queen was even more important. He was about to receive some information that was going to devastate him. And knowing the heart of Esther and knowing how much he could trust Esther was going to be important in this moment. So as we go into the next part, I want you to keep those things in mind. Let's read verse four. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I would remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. So now Esther makes a clear, compelling, and challenging request to the king. She's asking that the life of her and her people be saved, but she's very clear about what she's asking for. Let's break this down a little bit more because I believe in this. We see how to approach authority with a request. The Bible does such an amazing job of teaching us how to deal with real life situations, y'all. And we pay close attention. We can learn so much of how to navigate things in a righteous and holy way and not avoid conflict or avoid the situation or avoid the uncomfortable conversation, but how to approach it in a holy and righteous way. So the first thing is she begins by stating the solution, not 
the problem. She asks that her life and the life of her people be spared. She enters the conversation solution focused. So he wasn't even fully aware of the problem yet, but he had a solution. The second thing is that she states the problem in a problematic way, meaning she uses words that reveal the depth of the problem. She doesn't soften the blow. Her words both inform and they alarm the king of what's going on and how severe it really is. You know, I think that it's our human nature to kind of try and soften the blow when we have difficult news to share with someone. It's just the way that we're created, you know, and we don't want to hear difficult news and we definitely don't want to share it. But there are times when we need for people to feel the emotion that's connected to the decision or the choice or the pain or the joy or whatever it may be. We want them to feel it and we don't want to pull back from that. And I see in this that Esther did not try to soften the blow. She did not use words that would minimize what was happening. She wanted him to feel the depth of what was happening. So she intentionally used words that would do that. And the third thing she did is she emphasized the severity of the situation by highlighting a less serious request, but indicating that this wasn't that. This was much more serious. When I read this, it made me think a little bit about my book, Taking the Five Leaves. There's a section of the book where I talk about Nehemiah and how he approached the king when he needed to go and rebuild the wall. And we see this theme with biblical characters where they have a way of approaching difficult conversations with high profile people. And God gives them the wisdom and instruction on how to do that. So if you are ever in a position, which you will be in life, I guarantee where you're wondering, how can I approach a conversation with this person? There are tools in the word of God to help you do that. If we read it and study it, we can learn so much about how to have these types of conversations. So if you haven't grabbed my book, though, Take It the Five Leaps, I want to encourage you to do that because I literally outline how Nehemiah approached his conversation with the king to prepare him to go into the leap that God was calling him to take. Now, there is one more very important thing that I want you to notice about this moment. But in order for me to share that with you, we've got to read verses five through eight. Who would do such a thing? King Xerxes demanded. Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? Esther replied. This wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in rage and went out into the palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, where he knew that the king intended to kill him. In despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclined just as the king was returning from the palace garden. The king exclaimed, will he even assault the queen right in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, signaling his doom. I want you to pay attention to something. Did you see that in Esther's initial request, she never mentioned Haman? She never mentioned him. She doesn't tell the who until she's asked. To me, this reveals her character and that her central motive was the people and not retaliation to Haman. Y'all, we could learn so much from that. Because Haman was literally out to kill her and her people, and yet she never mentioned his name until the question was asked, who is doing this? She focused on the problem, and she focused on the solution, and that was it. When she went before the king, the reason God was able to show up the way that he did on her behalf is because she had clean hands and a pure heart. Y'all, that's what we need. We don't have time to be focused on, you know, retaliating against one person or another person. They said this to me. They did this to my kids. They did this to my spouse. They did this. No, we want to have clean hands and a pure heart and let the Lord fight our battles. Now, when Esther used the words adversary and enemy, I believe that it provoked a different kind of anger in King Xerxes. It said that he went into a rage. That means an extreme anger. Remember in chapter one, how we talked about banquets being an event where the king and the military and the officials and nobles would come together to strategize for war for an opposing enemy or for an opposing region or country. So these words during a banquet may have been triggering words for King Xerxes to hear an adversary and an enemy sitting right next to him. Essentially, Haman was a traitor. And he saw that right next to him, someone who was so close to him, he was second in command. He trusted him that much with his very life was now an adversary and an enemy. There is something for us to learn here from Esther. We must choose our words wisely and timely. 
we see that Esther chose her words wisely. She didn't go off and say all the things that happened. She said the facts, but she made sure she said it at the right time. Now let's begin wrapping this up with verses 9 and 10. Then Harbono, one of the king's eunuchs, said, Haman has set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. Then impale Haman on it, the king ordered. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. You know, I really want to end our time together by talking about five lessons that we can learn from Haman. I know in the previous chapters, we really dealt with the issue of a corrupt leader and how to identify a corrupt leader and how to not become one. But there are practical everyday lessons that we can learn from the life of Haman. Number one, pride comes before a downfall. Haman's pride and desire for honor are central to his character. He expected everyone to bow to him. And when Mordecai refused, it fueled his hatred. Haman's pride blinded him to the consequences of his own actions, ultimately leading to his own demise. This teaches us that excessive pride can cloud judgment and lead to one's downfall. The second lesson that we can learn is that hatred and prejudice have consequences. Haman's hatred of Mordecai and the Jewish people drove him to plot their annihilation. His prejudice and deep-seated animosity revealed how destructive unchecked hatred can be. Haman's actions backfire, emphasizing that harboring hatred often harms the one who harbors it the most. Every bit of hatred that he had toward the other people came back to him. He was not exempt for the consequences of the choice to carry hatred in his heart or prejudice in his heart towards the Jews. We won't be exempt from it either. Number three, we can learn the dangers of misused power. Haman's abuse of his position of authority for personal vendettas shows the consequences of misused power. He manipulated the king to issue a decree to destroy an entire people, demonstrating how selfishly used power can lead to catastrophic outcomes. Power should be used responsibly for the greater good, not for personal gain or revenge. When God entrusts us with more power, it should not be used for personal gain. It should not be used to manipulate other people. It should not be used to get back at people who have hurt us and to show them, look at what I'm doing. Oh, now I can tell you this, or I can tell you that because I'm in authority over you. That is not what it should be used for. And when it is used for that, it will always come back to us. And we will have to deal with the consequences of not using our power right. The fourth lesson that we learned from Haman is the importance of humility. Haman's story serves as a reminder of the value of humility. While he saw recognition and honor, his arrogance highlighted his flaws. In contrast, Esther and Mordecai displayed humility and wisdom, which ultimately led to their success. Humility allows one to see situations clearly and make better decisions. When you have a humble posture, you can see clearly what's going on around you and you can make decisions not based off of your emotions or anger or frustration or rage or disappointment, but you can make decisions from a humble posture of being on the other side. And the decisions that you make will often not be for your own gain, but for other people. And the fifth and final lesson is that evil plots often backfire. Haman constructed a pole intended for Mordecai. But it was Haman himself who was hung on that pole. This turn of events is a powerful reminder that malicious schemes often have unintended consequences. The story highlights that wrongdoing frequently catches up with those who commit it, sometimes in an ironic way. It's so interesting how Haman had this whole plot to destroy Mordecai and destroy the Jews. And when you look back at it, what we see is a heart of hatred and bitterness. But the other thing that I thought to be very interesting is that he never shared with Mordecai, King Xerxes, or Esther what was going on within his heart. But God saw it. See, God knows what is in a man's heart. God knows what is in our hearts. Even right now, there's so much going on in the world. I'm seeing things happening with church leaders and entertainers and people from all over. And what we are seeing is the evidence of what happens when people get power, they get influence, 
but their hearts are not committed to God. And God will eventually allow that person's heart to be revealed. I tell my kids all the time, everything in the dark comes to the light. And that includes what is in your heart. If there is any hatred or bitterness or resentment towards someone or towards a group of people simply because they don't look like you, they don't act like you, they don't have the same background or the same history, they ain't been through what you've been through. If you are harboring hatred, anger, or bitterness in your heart, God sees that it is there. And he will deal with the hearts. He is a God that cares about what's going on in the heart, not the words coming out of your mouth, not the fact that you're showing up to church every Sunday. He doesn't care about none of that stuff. He's looking at the heart. Haman's heart was evil, but Esther and Mordecai's heart was pure and clean. Y'all, we got to remove the gunk from our hearts. We got to remove anything that will cause us to not have clean hands and a pure heart from our lives. We have to repent and confess every single day. Just because we are followers of Jesus now does not mean that we do not have to repent and confess every single day. Y'all, there's Haman's all over the world right now, but we don't want to be one and not know it. We want to be the Esthers and the Mordecais. All right, y'all. So that's it for Esther chapter seven. Now it is time to go into Esther chapter eight. But again, as always, if you have not done so already, grab the Esther study guide, dig deeper into this book, because I know that God has something he wants to reveal specifically to you as you walk this journey of faith. God bless you. And remember, time with God is time you will never regret spending. I'll see you in Esther chapter eight.